On behalf of the Tech Center for Private Equity and Venture Capital, I want to thank you for attending our next panel on Farming of the Future Robotics. I'm Caleb Darkin. I'm ready to now introduce our panelists. We have three very interesting, fairly early stage robotics companies who are making exciting advances, which will hopefully transform the nature of farming. First, on the upper right part of your screen, we have Trevor Thompson. Trevor is the president of TerraClear, which is focused on rock picking robotics. He, prior to TerraClear, he served in this country as a Navy SEAL. He's a graduate of the Naval Academy and as a Rhodes Scholar, received a master's degree from Oxford. And while Trevor himself did not attend Dartmouth, the founder of TerraClear, Brett Fry, is a Dartmouth alumni. Next, on the bottom right part of the screen, we have Gino Papieri. He's the founder and CEO of Bear Flag Robotics. He previously has worked in a variety of tech industry jobs and holds degrees from Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, and the Wharton School. And finally, at the bottom left part of the screen is Betsaba uh, Herman. Betsaba is a board member and chair of the board for uh, Adu Peak Robotics. She's a strategy and innovation executive and a scientist and an engineer by training. She co-founded New Peak Robotics two years ago and is a tough 2013 alumni. This is an exciting panel because I think that each of these companies focuses on a different segment of agricultural robotics. So to start off, I want to e ask each of the panelists to briefly introduce their company and what segment of the robotics industry they're active in. Trevor, why don't you lead off? Cool. Thanks, Caleb. Really happy to be here. Uh, one of the kind of top benefits of being at TerraClear is that I'm, I'm tied into the Dartmouth network now. So I've met a lot of great people in, in ag and outside of that. So really happy to happy to be here. So TerraClear, as Caleb mentioned, is solving uh, um, one of the jobs that's sort of left behind in, in automation. And that's, you know, maybe the unsexiest task in farming and that's rocks and fields. And so, you know, even with some light disruption in field, you're going to get rocks that arise annually and you know, there's, there's a lot of you know, tools out there to solve the problem, but they're typically what ends up happening is folks end up picking them by hand, you know, largely because it doesn't tear up the soil. It's sort of available in different times and field conditions. And in many cases, it's just faster. So we're really building a solution that's that's much more efficient than that, um, that sort of takes this very unsavory task away from the farmer so they can focus on more important things. And the solution is oriented around a map that for large scale farms tells you where the rocks are located. And so you can go straight to the problematic ones. Uh, and then a robotic solution that removes them with efficiency. So starting now with a, a tool that um, retrofits onto a skid steer, works, uh, or, or a front end loader tractor, uh, and removes those rocks, and then driving ultimately towards a fully autonomous uh, tool. Great. Thanks, Trevor. How about Gina? Can you talk to us a little bit about Bear Flag Robotics? Thanks, Caleb. Absolutely thrilled to be here. I think this is my, my third year on the panel, which is just a thrill. Um, I um, can't believe I keep getting the nod to come back. So I, I guess we're doing something right. But I mean, over the last two years, Holy Smokes have come a long way. So it's a, it's a thrill to share the progress too. Bear Flag Robotics builds autonomous technology for farm tractors. So we don't build the technology themselves. Um, we procure those from customers, um, rental fleets, dealerships. We put our technology on them, the LIDARs and cameras and radars and all the sensors to make them autonomous and then deploy them to growers as a service. Um, we're based in... Um, San Francisco Bay Area, but run operations all over California, Arizona, and the West Coast. Fantastic. And Betsva, tell us about New Peak. Thanks, Caleb. Great to be here as well. I've attended this conference uh, the past two years, and it's been always wonderful. And the past two days have been great. A shout out, I'll make a shout out to a couple of the panelists who've said things that I thought were quite amazing uh, later on as well. So New Peak is an early stage robotics company. Uh, we do autonomous picking of fruit, soft fruit on farms. We work with farmers who are having a hard time finding uh, laborers to do fruit picking. Uh, there's a huge food uh, waste, basically some of these fruits and vegetables that are just left unpicked on the farm because there's a shortage of uh, laborers on the farms that the farmers deal with. There's also a high uh, rate of unpredictability to how farmers are looking at pricing their their fruits and vegetables, as well as uh, where the peaks are in their yields. So we help with all of those things. We're basically, there are 70% of the, market, uh, the farmers that can't find uh, enough laborers all the time. How we do this is towards swarm robotics and having come up with proprietary ways of picking fruit, soft fruit, without damaging the actual fruit itself. Great, thank you. 
So earlier this afternoon, we heard from Brad Arnold about AGCO. And AGCO is a leader of precision robotics, more focused on road crops and large-scale operations. But each of your companies, as you described, focuses on more niche products or niche operations. Why did you pick that specific niche to target and make your initial market entry? That's about Do you want to start off? I can go first. Yeah. So for us, we pick strawberries because they are one, a low hanging fruit. So figuratively and literally, as we like to joke about it, um, it's it's also one of the softer fruits and being able to pick it at different times of the day, for example, at night, similar to other fruits actually makes a difference in shelf life. So for us, we started from strawberries. We've actually expanded to tomatoes at the moment. And we are also going with fruits and vegetables that could be indoor and outdoor, which allows us to be able to test the different technologies needed for picking outdoor and picking indoor into in uh, greenhouses. So we picked something that we start from, but it's just the beginning. And we're expanding from that, taking the technology of what we're learning and going to other fruits and vegetables as well. So Trevor, why rock picking? How did Clear get into that? Yeah, we get that question a lot. I think, um, you know, for us, it's, it really started with the farmer. So, you know, Brad mentioned this earlier, or, uh, you know, in, in the in the conversation around a product focus versus a kind of farmer orientation. And that's, you know, founded, you know, with a company founded by a farmer who sort of has lived this problem for a long time, um, it was just sort of the thing that that people were really uh, frustrated with. And it's it sort of fits nicely into the, you know, the D's of dull, dirty, dangerous, difficult, you know, whatever. So, so it's sort of, we saw it as a great application for automation, something that there's, it's very inefficient right now. And it's, it's something that people don't like to do. And they just sort of, um, you know, put out of their mind. There's a, you know, a cliche that it's sort of harder to see rocks as the day goes on when, you, when you're picking them um, because it's something people don't like. And so looking for an efficient uh, solution that's, that's practical and has an immediate ROI to a farmer uh, is something that, you know, we're really excited about as an entry point into, Automation. I mean, I think you know from the, from the business side, it, it's also bringing automation to uh, a, a problem that affects a large number of acres is a really nice entry point into um, yeah, just a, a very large market that's sort of ripe for I think a lot of automation. So, Gina, you know, why, why autonomous tractors and why focus on producing the more backbone and infrastructure which makes the autonomy possible in sourcing the equipment from third parties? Yeah, I mean, similar similar to the other founders said, when when we approached this problem, you know, back in 2017, my co-founder Aubrey and I, we you know, we spent the summer of 2017. We're not farmers, right? We we're newcomers to this industry. We spent the summer of 2017 just talking to every grower we could, you know, we could find. We talked to everything from tobacco to sweet corn to tree nuts to produce. Obviously, corn, soy, wheat, alfalfa. Like you, like there's not a crop that's grown that we didn't talk to someone who grows it. Don't don't hold me to that. But like probably like 80 percent coverage there. But, you know, we kept hearing the same things over and over. And so as we approached, you know, the, the industry and the problem with that, you know, how can we how can we build the framework for something that can scale across as much of agriculture as possible? How can we have the most impact and drive the most value across the broadest swath of growers and farmers um, that, that we could? And so in order to fulfill that thesis, we wanted to automate, you know, the base unit, the the tractor, the 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 thing that does all the work on the farm. And furthermore, then we said, okay, well, well, great. Like, listen, this is this is the versatile tool. How can how can we make this more usable? How can we not only you know help with the automation, but also the analytics and the insight and the data? Where can we add our value? And rather than trying to build the tractor from scratch, where we didn't think we could actually increase the value or deliver much on top of what already existed, we really focused our value prop on the perception, the autonomous, the web interface, the safety, and then the data, the analytics that so we can give back to the grower to help them increase yields beyond just, you know, this, this cost saving measure itself. Great. And I guess, Gino, what is the value proposition that autonomous tractors actually offer to the farmer? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, ostensibly autonomous tractors are this, you know, labor saving device, right? And if you talk, um, talk to at least most of the growers we talk to, labor is one of their most acute pain points, right? And we work with some of the largest growers in the country, um, folks that farm over 100,000 acres. They have um, many hundreds of millions of dollars of rolling stock. They have thousands of people on staff. They have many hundreds of equipment operators. And the most acute pain point is finding folks who are dependable, show up on time, easy on the equipment, are safe, um, you know, reliable, understand the operation. Like these are the acute pain points in agriculture. And Verify helps solve that. Now, as we look out beyond that, what we're actually doing too is collecting all this information about how our growers 
our farming. Like there's fields in central California that, that we did the fall tillage, spring tillage. We knew exactly when those seeds are going in the ground and now we're doing cultivating. We have these incredibly robust insights to how these crops, we've already made, you know, six months in, we've already made, call it six or eight passes through the same field with our LIDARs, radars, cameras. And we're giving all those insights directly back to the grower we're working with their agronomists to understand what kind of insights can we help them achieve so that they can increase yields, especially like this year in a drought year in California, now more than ever, it's way more than just labor savings. It's how can we create upside for our growers as well. What about you, Trevor? It's like, how do you provide value by picking the rocks for the farmers versus them having to either go by hand or use some other equipment? It's like, what's the value and how can you provide value for your farmers? Yeah, so, um, you know, to farmers who've dealt with this for a long time, it's it's fairly obvious, right? I mean, in the sense that it's, it's a job that they don't like to do and there's a clear, you know, the ROI is the, the giant pile of, or the evidence, I should say, of, of the effectiveness is a big pile of rocks. It's you know done very quickly, and so what it enables is them to have you know this this fast farming cycle where they don't have the risk of equipment damage or potential downtime with a seeder or a harvester or a combine. Um, and those are really critical windows. So anything that we can do to sort of reduce the stress and anxiety during that period, speed up their farming cycle, is just exciting to you know especially larger operations. Um, you know, there's there's also on the um, on the uh, uh, mapping side, you know, the ability for, for farmers to even if they if, if they don't pick them, you know, as they're planting and they have the rocks that are out there, just the, the knowledge of where those are, uh, again, allows them to mitigate a lot of that risk uh, and pick those when they have a bit more time. So it kind of it, it's it's flex, it allows a little flexibility on the time. So that's why you brought up labor. What else does a strawberry and other soft uh, fruit picking robot really add to the farmers. I was going to say everything Gino said, uh, including the insights and what <laughs> you did a very good coverage of all of that, Gino. But um, for us, laborers also can't pick under certain conditions. So night picking is one of the important pieces of this. Uh, the fruit that you pick at night has two times the shelf life than the fruit that is picked during the day. Uh, that's a huge thing for farmers because um, that means that during the transport, their fruit doesn't get damaged as much, doesn't get rotten as much. And that makes a huge difference for them. Uh, that access to laborers and being able to do the training and the safety and all those things. Again, you know, you did a very great job of covering it all. Um, that's that's another uh, important part. And when it comes to price predictions and when it comes to understanding what the health of their plants are, what is what is it actually happening to the plants all across the farm as well? Um, it's important to be able to give these farmers some of those data insights so they know what is happening to their plants across the field. And that's what autonomous picking that picks up other data points as well provides. That's great. So this is a question mainly for Betsaba and for Trevor. So Betsaba, strawberries are a seasonal fruit. Trevor, I guess rock picking is part of field preparation. That obviously happens only at the beginning of the season. What do you do with your equipment the rest of the year? Or how does that really inform the go-to-market business model that you actually use? So for us, um, that indoor outdoor picking I mentioned earlier actually makes a difference because to be able to take the exact same robot and the same AI and machine learning and pieces that we have in there. So we don't have to actually pick up a new robotic machine and a new, a new gripper and be able to go from indoor and outdoor makes a difference because that takes out that seasonal, um, constraint. In addition, picking tomatoes has been uh, an addition to us and Picking in different regions extends your season. So going from, say, picking in British Columbia to several other parts of the U.S., um, like California, et cetera, also makes a difference. So being a, and that's why we've been working, and I know this is not specifically your question, but uh, we've also been working at, for now, we're doing this as a robot's are out there to service the farms. We're not selling them. We're not renting them. We're just like this is a this is a this is a service we offer because that allows us also the flexibility to go from farm to farm and be able to address where the need is and what the season is. Yeah. So for us, uh, you know, I, I think um, part of it is there's the technology sort of unlocks when people can solve this problem, right? So today, if you're using you know a big mechanical rock picker that's digging hard through the ground. You really you can only do that in sort of loose soil, preceded. Otherwise, you're you're 
you know, counterproductive there. So the idea of, of the tool we have is that it's picking from the top down and just grabbing the rock and leaving the soil. That really widens when you're able to do this. And so it lends itself nicely to large farms that have this problem or really even small farms that have a really acute problem or a service model. So somebody with this tool that can cover, you know, whether it's, you know, leasing five of these out in, a, in, a, in an area or having a couple of these on hand so that he can pick for farmers as needed in different conditions. So that, that's really kind of longer term, especially as we're driving to um, a more you know, complex solution in the, in the autonomy, um, it, it does lend itself to that service model. So Trevor, you brought up large farms, you brought up small farms. Who is your target customer segment? Is it everyone or who do you initially target? Who are going to be the early adopters and how do you really explain your value proposition to them? Yeah, so I mean, there, there's, there's, there are large farms that we work with that spend 150,000 on just labor solving this single problem. It's kind of crazy, right? Because they're picking, these are, you know, maybe a potato farm that's picking four or five times a year and they're bringing a lot of that labor in. And so that's a super obvious, you know, if you're 10X more efficient, then there's massive savings there. Um, and so we really expected to kind of focus on the large farms, particularly row crops in the Northern part of the US, soybeans, that's sort of the, the sweet spot. Um, but what we found is, you know, surprisingly, we're getting a lot of interest from farms that what we, we maybe wouldn't have had on our radar. So um, either areas that the problem is less acute, you know, like California um, or, or, or farms that just, you know, there's, you know, a sod farmer or, uh, you know, different crops that are less traditional or even farms that are looking at, um, you know, they've got primarily, uh, um, you know, cattle and they're, and they're maybe going to share that among some of their neighbors. And so, you know, we came in with this impression of a certain kind of demographic and we're actually seeing that it's a little bit more applicable to different types of farms. So Gina, who's the right customer for autonomous farming? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a similar answer, sort of what Trevor said yeah. there. You know, our strategy, we're a startup, right? Our strategy um, has to be to go after the biggest farms and, and that's what we're doing, right? It's it's typically farms um, that, you know, have have other sort of, you know, infrastructure already in place, or already have, you know, maybe even IT folks on staff, at, you know, at that scale. Um, those those are the obvious ones, but, you know, from there looking down to, you know, middle, you know, middle and small market too, we can, we can help everyone, right? Like everyone feels the labor problem. And even if it's not just keeping people on staff, even if it is owner operated, there's always weather pressure, you know, in the Midwest, after you harvest, you're trying to get your fall tillage in before it gets too cold. Like all these things compel, like all these things drive towards this need for either, um, you know, ro robust, you know, um, teams throughout the year or really spiky demand, you know, at certain peak seasons uh, and autonomous helps with all of that. So when you have an autonomous tractor, you have a lot of sensors, you have machine vision, you're getting a lot of data. Obviously that's helping drive the tractor and uh, figuring out the maps of where the crop will be, but what else can you use that data in analytics for? Yeah, I mean, the, we, we have this, um, you know, this problem of abundance right now. And really the, the trick for Verflag is you know, how to deliver meaningful, actionable data, right? Like we can't just turn over petabytes of data and say here, like, you know, hope this helps, right? Like that's, that's not going to work, right? And, and there's, there's this like long list of ag tech startups before Verflag who figured it out the hard way. And so for us, it's working very closely with the agronomists to determine what's useful for them. I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a, a good example here. So um, you know, we, when we do fields, we can do um, the, the fall tillage pass and then spring tillage pass. And what you can tell is like the difference in engine load and, and you know, fuel flow and track slip, things that you would, you would be able to determine anyway um, through your existing telemetry. So we can tell, hey, listen, like we did this, you know, this chisel pass and then we did spring tillage and we actually saw, we can see the compaction of someone driving their pickup truck across the field, like just diagonally across that field, like, or, like just like a jerk, right? Like just drove directly across that field. And we can see that heat map in our, you know, our spring bed prep. But then when we go through cultivating, we can actually see the effect on the yield of those, of that across, you know, the same swath of land, right? So like your crops will have diminished yield in this exact place where there was more soil compaction. And then we can relate that back and say, hey, listen, like, I realize this is going to happen, but if we can identify this, does it make sense to make an extra tillage pass to get rid of that? Or are we going to make it up in the yields, right? Like, and it becomes a very qu quantitative decision, right? We can give that data back to the grower and have them make a decision like that. Those are the early things we're seeing. Um, they're super actionable today. So Trevor, you create a map of where all the rocks are. Is there other data that you're collecting that you find interesting for the farmers? Yeah, I mean, to, to Gina's answer, there's a lot. And, and uh, I, I thought he was going a different direction in terms of the abundance of opportunity. I mean, for, for us, um, it's really trying to stay focused on something 
you know, immediate and material that we can solve. I think there's, uh, there's just so much opportunity when you're, when you're already flying there. One of the advantages we have right now is that we've got, um, you know, an aerial map and we've got a proximal map that we're generating uh, from, the, from the ground level. And so being able to sort of tie those two points together allows for some interesting, um, you know, uh, insights with that data. But would totally double down on the value of data is almost nothing to farmers. It really does come down to what, what are you doing with it? What are those insights? And it's, it's a hard problem. And I think, um, you know, particularly, yeah, I think just data in general in ag is, is easy. I think high quality data is really challenging, particularly when you're applying machine learning, because you've got really tight windows where the field field is changing almost every day throughout the year. You know, the soil is going to look different and the crop in the field is going to be different. And so you really have tight windows. So becoming efficient um, with that data collection and then, and then, you know, effective with turning that into insights with a smaller amount of data is going to be, I think, really important over the next few years. What is insightful data to your farmers and how do you make it insightful so you're not just, as Ajino said, just turning over gobs and gobs of data, which they don't know how to interpret? Well, I think there's a, I mean, I'll, I'll let you guys answer. I, my, the short answer for me is something that's really user-friendly and, and likely fits within their existing kind of, uh, you know, practices and timing, right? So asking them to use some data that, that changes their existing farming cycle is almost a non-starter in all cases. And so um, now it's, it's what the challenging part of that is to really make it, you know, easy, clear, user-friendly and have an immediate ROI. And I think farmers are very, very responsive to that. Um, you know, when, when, they, when they're presented with a good argument of why something's going to save them money or make them more money, it's, it's very clear that you're going to get adoption pretty quickly. So I think just making it very user friendly uh, and, and, and this, this has been you know, mentioned a few times over the past few days, but uh, there are a lot of tools out there. And so as, the, as much as we can cooperate and sort of have all these on, you know, um, fewer devices, uh, fewer pieces of software for the farmer, I think that's going to help. Great. And before I ask my next question, I want to remind the audience that if you have any questions, you can put them in the ask a question box that's at the bottom of the screen. And I'll be try to, sure to try to ask them. But I guess my next question is for Betsvik. People have looked at and identified strawberries and fruits as a sort of a hard problem to solve for many years. How are you going about solving the problem? What is your technological advance and how do you have the breakthrough solution? Well, one of our biggest proprietary uh, advantages, I think, is the gripper. So it's an in-house developed gripper that picks soft fruit. And I, and I mentioned that because soft fruit is so uh, delicate and it's easy to damage even by human pickers, let alone by um, actual robotic pickers. And I think farmers might be less forgiving of robots anyways, <laughs> in this case. Uh, so for us, having to perfect that in the beginning has been a front and center issue. And we are at the point that we're very comfortable with uh, having the robot grippers pick on pick strawberries. And we know that it's, it, it really follows uh, certain rules and that, that really keeps these strawberries and even tomatoes now uh, completely perfect. And that's been one of the, one of the pieces um, of technological advances, if you'd like to call it. Um, the other, the other part is also about the navigation. Uh, and uh, again, as I mentioned earlier to going from indoor to outdoor and vice versa is challenging. There are like one you're looking at LIDAR and the other one you're looking at GPS. And there's also different pieces of equipment that are different. Um, and for us, choosing Swarm Robotics has had an advantage because the uptime is a lot higher. Uh, if a piece of the robot breaks, it's one of your many robots. It's not the main one that's like a huge, massive machine in the middle of a field and it could break down and parts are cheaper. They're not as expensive to fix. Um, it, it also, so there is the, this other piece of having it basically a centralized control, but in a way, a decentralized brain behind it all that also follows the whole idea of Swarm Robotics, because you have to have multiple robots all knowing how to work alongside each other, just like humans would be able to do that. Um, and those are all small and large challenges we have grappled with over the past uh, two years. And I think Swarm Robotics was something Brad Arnold from ICO mentioned as uh, something which is going to definitely or potentially change the industry for the better. So I, I guess, Gina, what, People have tried to use machine vision and other types of autonomous technology a lot in the past. What is your breakthrough? Yeah, goodness. I mean, it's a super hard problem. Um, and there's, uh, yeah, there's no easy parts about it, right? I think the really 
the part that gets the headlines and the sexiest part is the perception, right? And of course, like we're doing incredible things there. And like, if you look online, you can see like our demos and it's, it's cool. That's what gets the attention. But really that's, that's a smaller part of the larger autonomy you know, problem in general, right? There's super robust systems and embedded systems and safety systems. And then all the user interfaces, like how do growers want to interact with their machines? How much is too much? How do we make this iPhone simple? How do you make an, an autonomous tractor iPhone simple? Like, holy smokes, like if you know the answer, like let me know, because that's what we're working towards, right? Like these are really hard problems and it's making sure it all comes together. I think the, the sort of the macro answer is well, sensor prices are coming down. There's incredible resources coming out of universities like research and also, you know, the trends in labor scarcity, climate change, and farm consolidation, like super play into this right now. That's the, that's the why now. Um, but as far as, you know, what, what, what's the hard part or what's bear, what's bear flags breakthrough? I mean, it's just all of the above. This is incredibly hard and there's no easy parts. Um, and even when you, even when you get those right, and I see these guys nodding, it's getting, getting a world-class operations team out there to actually implement it at the farms and having that operations team, um, you know, be farmers who understand it and talk the talk and walk the walk and can interact with our, you know, our customers and our growers, but then also have the technical, you know, understanding and the technical patience to interface an engineering team back down, back home when it's two in the morning and the tractor stop and we don't know what's going on. And like, well, he said this and, you know, she said that other thing and we're trying to solve this problem. Like those are the hard moments, right? Those are the hard things that's, you know, and it, I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is it just comes back to team. What about you, Trevor? I mean, yeah, I don't think I can uh, add a ton to that. Um, you know, I think the uh, the one of the, the the kind of what I guess we bring is the integration of all these things, right? So that's that's essentially what you know, Gina is saying. And the the these ideas are fairly easy to sort of put out there, but the the integration of really deeply understanding farming and the combination of some really challenging technologies. I mean, all the things that we're talking about today. Um, I think what that unlocks is this application of the, you know, for example, machine vision is something that um, you're, you're probably not going to get a bunch of insights in the next few years of things that humans can't detect, right? We're basically doing the same thing, maybe a little bit not as good or as good as a human, but what it unlocks is uh, this just this, you know, this efficiency. It allows, you know, speed and scale of constant insights. And so figuring out a way uh, for us to say, okay, well, we have a cutting edge, amazing technology team. We've got an amazing kind of farming background. How do we bridge these two things? I mean, that's really the essence of it. And I think, um, you know, th there are some things that we think, you know, similar to Betsa Bay, you know, our design of the opposing track paddle system, the integration of the machine vision, all that is really novel. You know, it's protected and it's it's really cool what we're doing. But I do think the, the if I were to say like the, the our strength as a company is the integration of a lot of this technology and the realities of farming. And that takes, it, it's taken us, you know, a few years to really dial that in and, and uh, it's a hard problem. So Trevor, I'm curious, I think you brought up that sometimes field preparation or rock picking can be $150,000 for the farmers. How much time do you actually save them, uh, like for the typical farm or for a specific size farm to rock picking and how, what can they reallocate that time towards? Yeah, so um, it's it's a kind of an impossible question to to answer in the sense that every farm is different, every problem has a different level of acuteness, every crop is going to have a different cycle. You know, one of the things on, on larger farms is they've got different fields with different crops, and you know, some is going to be fall planting, some is going to be in the spring, and so you know, it, it really can be a matter of um, months on some farms and certain crops, and it can be as small as a few days, but they're really important days and they're really cute days, and so um, in terms of uh, what they can reallocate that labor to. I mean, God, there's just a, there's sort of an endless list of things. And a big part of that is, you know, they can plant exactly when they want to plant, you know, they can fertilize in series. So an example of, uh, you know, initially we really thought farms were going to cultivate, we'll fly the field, we'll, we'll go pick the rocks for them as a service, and then they'll come back through and, and plant and, and spray. Now, what we actually see in many cases is they want to do all that stuff at once. And so they'll take the tool out there, they'll pick sort of in series, and that, that unlocks, you now have an efficiency of solving this problem that it doesn't have to be kind of multi-staged. And so it allows them to get everything done much more efficiently and sort of uh, reduce the anxiety around those stressful periods, and then potentially use the map after to go back through and verify that, that they've solved the problem correctly. Great. So I think that on some of the earlier panels, we heard about fifth generation farmers, some farmers um, not exactly adopting all the newest technologies as soon as it launched in the market. 
Gino Betsiba, I know that you've worked at other high tech startups. How, how do you drive customer adoption in an industry which sometimes is not the fastest to adopt new technologies? I can start on this. So the other industry I go deep in is healthcare. And actually I find health and uh, healthcare and uh, agriculture have a lot in common. They're both relationship driven and they are both quite a bit slow to adoption at times, even though they both should be quite a bit high to a uh, high rate of adoption because they're so central to our lives uh, as humans. Um, I think for us, the first farms that we've started with, it's been more of a partnership, working with the farmers, really understanding their problems so that we're not looking at this from that my two tech, tech co-founders are engineering physicists. We're not looking at this from an engineering physicist per perspective, but really from a farmer's perspective of what is it that they deal with. That's how we found out some of those things around, hey, uh, they actually appreciate night picking. Or what are, what are some of the other things that they would like us to work with? So this is not so much about replacing the human laborers, but working alongside human laborers and filling some of those gaps. Maybe over time, those resources that they have, the laborers that they get and they plan for throughout the year can be allocated to things that the robots cannot do. And that's where like over time, this allows the farmers to become more efficient. So it's it's really been a partnership from day one. And it is uh, not necessarily, I think it, it's not for the faint of the heart. It's uh, This is not an easy industry as cool as the tech looks like. And I, you know, nodding, I'll pass it on to you to continue. No, that's well, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's nothing easy, right? Starves are hard, ag is hard. Um, there's there's no easy parts. Um, yeah, to 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 just follow on to exactly what was said, I think from our perspective, and we did a lot of, you know, we 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 we, we didn't get it right at the start for sure, and God knows we make mistakes every single day. But I think one of the things that we really found is great is going to the customers that are most ready to adopt. And there's this really happy coincidence that we've discovered that the the customers of the most scale are actually the early adopters, right? So these are the folks. Who have the most acute pain points across labor, across productivity, um, across you know data and yield management? They already have a lot of this stuff. They're already trying to do a lot of these things. Like one of our customers has three full-time engineers on staff. Like holy smokes! Like yes, this is a good integration point for Bearfly. Like, let's go work with you know those customers first as we develop that partnership. As we you know fail fail fast and fail frequently with them, have a closed feedback loop with them. They can tell us. That, that's garbage, that's garbage, that won't work, that'll never work. And finally, the fifth or sixth time, we like, oh, it's clicking, like, yeah, this is working, we have something here, right? And so working super closely with the customers and finding the right ones to work with, not trying to shove a round peg in a square hole um, with a grower that's not ready yet. I guess when you're thinking about it, what is the reticence of the farmers that you start to speak with to adopt into technology? Is it a function of not, they don't view the, the problem you're going after is a problem for them specifically? Is it not actually understanding how you can add value? Is it a matter of economics and not seeing the payback? Or is it a matter of capital costs? Farm equipment's pretty expensive. And for traditional farm equipment, there's a lot of financing available. Yeah, I mean, at least from our perspective, happily, we're supply limited. So it hasn't, you know, if someone's not ready, we, we don't spend a lot of time there trying to convince them to be ready. Um, there's there's enough demand that we have that we have that luxury. I think it comes back to all sorts of things, right? Like, hey, this is the way we've always done it, and I'll let someone someone else try it out first, um, sort of thing. Um, usually, um, you know, like I say, like my I have two I have two favorite moments, sort of you know, being 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 running this company, and the first is going out, and, you know, visiting farms and learning from New York, seeing all kinds of things, and um, I've had the amazing opportunity to visit hundreds of farms over the last couple of years and get to meet. A ton of folks um, and see a ton of things. And then the second, second favorite part is where you're standing at the edge of the field with a grower, and we're looking at an autonomous tractor running in their field. Um, you know, usually they they make some. You know, there's some low whistles and some four letter words, and it's it's fun. Like that's a cool moment, right? Um, when you get that aha moment, and once they see an autonomous tractor actually working in their field, there's it's it's really not like a leap, right? Like it's it's actually kind of a layout from there. Right. And we have a question from the audience. Skyler asked your, if, if anyone uses AgriSync or a similar platform to aid in the customer service while you're far from the user. I think we're just too early stage for that yet. Yeah, fair enough. And that was speaking for myself, not yeah, I'm not, I, sure. I'm not I haven't had the pleasure of using it yet. So obviously you're all disruptive robotic companies, but there's new technologies out there all the time. 
What are, what are the technologies that you're thinking about in five years that you might be able to integrate into your offering, which could really substantially change the adoption curve for your offering? I mean, obviously there's a lot of things coming out of Silicon Valley. It's like, Gina, you don't have a background in farm equipment. You're not a farmer. It's like, you're coming at this from the tech angle. What are these new technological advances that will completely change your product going forward? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think super tactically, um, and this is, I don't think this is what you meant, but designing systems to be modular, right? So like our perception system is the perfect example. It's coming along so quickly, right? And we have, um, I, I won't say the name of the company. If you go online, you can figure out super quickly who we're using for LiDARs right now. These are awesome, best in class, but but they'll be obsolete in 18 months, right? And so we need to design good interfaces where, listen, we have, it's basically a time of flight sensor that gives you a point cloud. And I really don't care like how that's manufactured or how it works, but like this is the data that the computer is getting in order to give situational awareness and job quality, right? Um, now, I, like I said, I don't think that's what you meant. I think what's more exciting is having, building a platform that other companies can then use to get their equipment in the field, right? So there's incredible technologies that like, either we were just hearing about or we, we haven't even heard about yet. Um, like um, talking to the guys at Bloomfield Robotics about doing a collaboration with them to get their sensors going through the field and tractors. This is where we need to be, right? We I can't answer all the things. We're not even close to answering some of the things, right? Like, so how can we work with other um, you know, exciting companies to get stuff into the field more quickly to to, to build a more robust ecosystem, robust, robust platform. Trevor, what do you think is next a Terra career? What other advances do you think and features you can integrate into your current offering? Yeah, so and I would you know quadruple down on the swarm concept. I think there's you know Brad said it earlier in it kind of a nice way where there's a lot that still needs big heavy equipment to go through the field. But I mean, we, we hear that the two things we hear a ton from farmers are labor problems. And it's not just the cost of labor. It's the sort of overhead and stress of dealing with a lot of that labor. That is just every farmer just about says that. Uh, and then generally some form of, hey, equipment cannot get bigger. You know, the, the roads are only so big and the soil can only take so much. And so as we're, you know, trying to drive towards better farming practices, things are just going to get smaller. So again, to Gina's point, I'm really excited about um, what this kind of platform opportunity is that allows for modular solutions um, that solve really specific problems for farmers. And so I think there's a ton of opportunity on the soil side, um, you know, to, to the conversations we've heard earlier in terms of, um, you know, measuring soil and getting information about soil. There's just a lot of opportunity there that I think autonomy can really help solve. And so for us, really driving to this uh, initial solution, I think there's there's other opportunities that we can apply the technology towards. The area that I think I'm excited about, in which I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, uh, just over the next few years, is there's so much data capture, but really the, the high quality and high efficient data capture and transfer in a, in a bandwidth constrained environment. I think, you know, once the, some of those things are unlocked, all of a sudden now, I think you, you gain some acceleration around real solutions through computer vision and, and other data insights. So Betsy, uh, Trevor just brought up Swarm Robotics. You're obviously a Swarm Robotics focused company. Why did you choose initially to uh, use a Swarm Robotics approach? What are the benefits that you really see to it? And how are you really educating the farmers about the benefits versus the larger scale of strawberry picking operation? So, um... I'm going to step one step back and actually talk about some of the technological advances that we are also looking for. So uh, right now, AI is it still and it's ANI, so uh, artificial narrow intelligence state. As we hopefully achieve the artificial general intelligence, there will be a lot of things shifting. So that's something that would dramatically advance the whole field and not just obviously agriculture. It would be impactful everywhere else where robots are not doing single tasks. They could do many tasks and the learning is more really like a human where they are able to observe many things. So one of the things I watch for is some of the advances in neuroscience, which in first glance may not be relevant to agriculture, but it actually is for autonomous robotics. For us, that and that's really central to also the whole concept of swarm robotics, because these are decentralized robots that learn to work together, just like human pickers. If you have 10 of them across a farm, these are 10 robots in different rows. They know not to crash into each other. They know what to pick that somebody else hasn't gone there before. And that organization between swarm the robots is complex, but it also actually makes it more replicating of the human labor that we are um, complementing, the shortage of it. So that's that's really where we've been focusing on. From, and from the beginning, and this is a kudos to the um, to Divan Anshul, who are uh, the technical brains behind this as well, 
they started thinking about the swarm robotics, reading a lot of R&D research paper coming out of universities. This is like really, really early days of still the idea. People are still arguing back and forth, swarm better versus it's not. And I think that's how we started it out. And we just had to at some point pick a, pick a route. Going that, that whole concept of the smaller robots, the different size and narrowness versus wideness of the uh, fields where we are actually doing the picking because each farm in different states, different provinces, they all have their own style. So swarm robots that are small and agile actually allow you to be able to be more flexible as well. Great. And I know that you're all early stage companies and you all have disruptive technology, but how quickly in what type of adoption curve you think you could actually see through your technologies and obviously did you know you brought up your capacity constraint right now so yeah um oh I, I i heard this from a candidate um and maybe everyone knows this except me and I'm, I'm just sharing it now but um he shared that you can you can build ladders or you can build rocket ships and a ladder is going to look really impressive while you're building it but a rocket ship's going to get you to the moon right um and so a lot of what we're thinking about is how do we build that rocket ship how do we test everything out and then we can light the fuse and go, right? There's no practical limitation how quickly it can grow. It's, there's plenty of demand. We have very modest production requirements, right? Um, we can leverage dealership support, so we don't need to go do that. These are all like basis, you know, the basis of the thesis for Bearfly. Like, what are the parts we want to work on? What are the parts that already exist that we can leverage, right? And so all this has been about building this rocket ship. And like, you know, quite candidly, um, you know, we are starting to light that fuse, right? We're, we are on these huge customers. We are getting orders for a, a huge number of machines. Um, and it's starting to happen, which is super exciting. So I think that we probably only have time for uh, one more question. I'm curious to hear, you're obviously all focused on different niches, rock picking, strawberry or in tomato picking at the moment, and then obviously autonomous tractors. What do you think is the next big area of advancement within agricultural robotics? Where are people not looking that maybe they should be looking? I don't know about them not looking, but, and this is completely biased because I have a science background. Um, I think the ag bio world and where synthetic biology comes together with seed and environment and like all of that is just so, like there's so much that could still be happen. And CRISPR is still fairly new and it's early days. Um, I think there's just a lot left for discovery, so. Caleb, I guess I'll answer the opposite of your uh, assumption. You know, the it's not so much that no one's looking, I think everyone's looking at sort of insights of uh, scouting, right? I mean, that, that is this big thing, but I, I think, you know, whether that comes in the form of drones, which everyone knows are sort of difficult and, and a pain in many cases, or it comes in a ground view, but whatever that is, I think the, the sort of on-field automation where you can really get insights throughout the entire season on the field is gonna be pretty incredible. Great, and it looks like we have time for one more question. And someone just put a question in, and Skylar is wondering how hard or easy has fundraising been for your visionary innovations? <laughs> well, raising a pandemic wasn't fun, but we did it. Um, I, I, can, I can tell you quite publicly, um, yeah, COVID was probably one of the most difficult times of my professional career. It was just the, throw out the rule book and survive. Um, and it's a credit to the team that we did, right? Like can't, can't take credit for it. We have an incredible team. Uh, my co-founder is incredible, just extremely formidable, extremely flexible um, and tenacious. Um, and happily 2021 seems to be a bit brighter. Yeah. Trevor? Wait, no, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, quick answer for us. I think, uh, you know, it was, it's, it's always a challenge, right? It's always kind of a fun opportunity as well. Um, the, the cool thing for us raising during this time is there's just a lot of constraints. And so it's a, it's a good chance to sort of reevaluate and kind of answer a lot of those hard questions. And so I, I found it to be strengthening, but, um, but it is, it's always challenging. Great. And we are just at our early stage of, we've just started fundraising. So I will be seeing a lot of these challenges. Um, for us, <laughs> we've had a bunch of non-dilutive funding that got us a head start early on, and that's been helpful. But I echo everything that Trevor and Egino said. <laughs> it is not easy during this time. Fantastic. Well, Trevor, Egino, Betsva, thank you very much for joining us. It all definitely seems like there's a lot of very exciting innovations out there. So and with that, I'm going to turn it over to the next event, which is the VSAT pitch competition finals. Thank you. Thanks.